All right, Merry Christmas, everybody. Thanks for coming out. Nothing like coming out to Mr. Grinch, man. Harsh. Boy, they're hard on our boy Grinch, aren't they? Yeah, thank <laughs> Yeah. You with me. I see you. I see you. Welcome, everybody. I'm Jared. If you're a guest with us, I have the joy of getting to be the senior pastor of these wonderful people known as Grace Community Church. So welcome to all of you. Welcome to all of you across our locations, all over Orange County and Fishkill and right here in this room and other rooms. So grateful you are here. You know, I was thinking about the Grinch story in, term, in, in terms of our time together, and I thought if there's anyone disturbed by Christmas, it is Mr. Grinch. And it's that word disturbed that grabbed me, disturbed. Have you ever thought of Christmas as a day of disturbance and not just celebration? So let's go right here to the Christmas story. I want to read it and see if you... See if you pick up on it here. This is Matthew chapter 2, verse 1. It says, After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the time of King Herod, magi, or wise men from the east, came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born king of the Jews? We saw his star in the east, and we have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed, and all Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Christ was to be born. In Bethlehem and Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, and the land of Judah are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you will come a ruler who will be the shepherd king of my people, Israel. And then Herod called the, Mag the Magi, the wise men, secretly, and he found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and make a careful search for the child, and as soon as you find him, report to me so that I too may go and murder him. I mean, worship him. Because we all know, I mean, even if you're not a Christian and Christmas is somewhat familiar, I'm sure you've heard of Herod and his, and his scheming ways. And he was a ruthless king, boy. He was ruthless. I mean, he was in a place that he called himself the self-appointed king of the Jews. And in order to protect his kingdom, he had even his own sons murdered because he thought they were a threat to his reign. So Herod was disturbed, and it all had to come around this word, king, king. And that's what I want to talk about for a little while. I guess if you called this message anything, it would be called disturbed by Christmas. And it all revolves, revolves around this word, king. Now, we don't get king in the West here. We don't, we don't get king in the States. I mean, the closest we get is Burger King and that creepy thing, whatever that is. <laughs> but if you think about it, I mean, if you've watched enough Netflix with all the king movies out there, all those movies, king, in, it, it invokes and it provokes. King is a glory word. King is a fighting word. King is a worship word. King is a bow down word. King is a command word. Matter of fact, where it says in Bethlehem, the, words, the word Bethlehem is, is typically translated house of bread. But the lehem on the end of Bethlehem also means fighters. So literally Jesus came from the house of fighters. I love that. Because I wonder how many of you walked in here this week, uh, yeah, this week, this Tuesday, thinking Jesus was the guy with the feathered hair and he petted his little lamb and smelled like essential oils. I don't know <laughs> what your view of Jesus is, but he is, he is from the house of fighters. This is almost like a real Game of Thrones happening here about who will be king and who's threatened. Because there's something about Jesus being king that ought to threaten or disturb you and me because we... We're not, we're not Herods, we're not ruthless and, and, and tyrants, I would assume for all of us, but we do have hearts like Herod. We have selfishness, we have our will, we, have, we want control, we have ego, and we have pride. We have, we have Herod hearts. We, we want to be on the throne of our own lives, kind of the king me, and that's where 
king can be a fighting term for us because of Jesus coming and showing us that he is the ultimate king, and there can't be two kings, only one. And so Jesus comes almost in a sense of bringing a glory fight to us about our heart's throne and who will take our heart's throne. Will it be you? Will it be me? Or will it be the one who is worthy and worth it? King Jesus. This is the disturbance with Christmas. Jesus is a threat to Herod's throne just in the way that he's a threat to Jared's throne and to your throne and to my throne. So there's this king word. It's a, it's a disturbing word. It's a glory word. It's a fighting word for our hearts. And speaking of hearts, Jesus made a big deal about hearts. God made a big deal about hearts throughout all the scriptures. And then you see Jesus in one episode there in Matthew chapter 15, verse 18, he says, their mouths confess, confess who I am, but their hearts are far from me. With their lips, they worship me, but their hearts are far from me. And he's talking to the religious. I don't know if you noticed it when we read about King Herod was disturbed and it said, and all Jerusalem with him. Jerusalem was the center of religion. So even religious people, were disturbed by what it mean, meant for Jesus to come and be king. The word heart, the ancients have showed us throughout history uh, of the importance of the heart, and of course that coming from God and Jesus and how the heart is to be the center of all we do. The heart is, is take, look at it in terms of the physical heart. So you have the heart that, that's the center here, and it pumps. So if you go to your wrist and you look for a pulse, you'll, you'll find a pulse. So you can go here in your neck and, and find a pulse. If you can't, um, we'll pray and call 911. Uh, but there's, there, those are pulses. Those aren't our lives. Our life is here in the rump up bump bum the center. And everything flows in our bodies. It's as if God's preaching a sermon to us through our very bodies, that the heart of our lives is to be a king who reigns there through which everything else flows and actually makes us even better. It makes us right with God for Christ to be our king through faith in him. And then God begins to work on us to become more and more like Jesus, full of joy and peace and forgiveness and grace and love and not being victims of things that go on in our lives, but victors. All of that with Jesus being king. But if you look at Herod again here, we see Herod and who he is on the throne, and it reminds me of, of who I am when I'm on my throne, so to speak. So for example, Herod wanted it his way. Herod had a my way. I'm going to do this my way. Anybody been there? Are you there? I'm going to tell you, I, even as a Christian, even as a pastor, there are times in my life where I just have not really said it out loud to God, but in my heart, I've just said to myself, I just want to do what I want. And I want to do it my way. I want to do my thing. And, you, and what I've done is I've grabbed hold of the throne. I've sat me on the king, the king of me, king me throne. And what I've noticed that when I put myself there, the, the shrapnel that comes not only into my life but through my life, trying to do it my way and doing what I want. And the best word I come up, that I can come up with about how it feels and the way it, I experience when I'm king me in my life is a disintegration that begins to happen. Uh, a disintegration, uh, 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 threats in my life, fra being fragile. So again, again, back to King Herod. As he was king, he also had a comparison issue. So where is the king of the Jews? Come and tell me so that I may go. So he was a self-appointed king of the Jews, and then he heard there was a king of the Jews literally born. He's threatened, and so he's comparing himself with this new king of the Jews, just like we tend to do if we're the king me on our, on our own thrones. And you can compare yourself to others and feel better about yourself, or you can compare yourself to others and feel worse about yourself. But that's what happens when we're on the throne of our own lives. We become very fragile there as well, very insecure when it's King Me. Very fragile, we're threatened, we're lonely, we, we feel victimized, we feel slighted by people around us. It makes us very cynical and even 
bitter to a large degree. We sense life is unfair. And at the end of the day, I hope you've realized that to be the king on the throne of your life instead of the king of kings on the throne of your life, you ultimately taste emptiness. Emptiness, nothing satisfies. I think of our dryer at home. You ever, you ever uh, had a quarter loose in your dryer when it turns and it just bangs around? That's what I think about when I try to fill my life with things of the world that I think will complete me. When I sit on the throne of my life and want everything else to bow to me as if it will satisfy me, it's like a quarter bouncing around in the dryer. It just, all of that just kind of rattles around. It does not satisfy because I realize I was never meant to be king. There's only one who is truly king. And it's one who ought to disturb you and disturb me as we think about who truly is king on our, in, in our lives. And if you get it all wrong, just think Kanye West got it right, people, all right? Jesus is king. He even got that. But, but the question will be, will you, will I, will you walk out of here today not seeing, thinking of it this way, that Christmas is not a time of admiration but devotion, there's a big difference between the two. And the hope is that with Jesus being king, the disturbance leads you from or through admiration to true devotion. And when it all comes down to it, this king word, this heart word, it's a worship word. Worship. Worship. Now, don't think of worship as a religion word. Don't think of worship as going to a church building somewhere and chanting something or singing something or hearing someone share from a platform Worship is, is by, worship is the very heart of who you are. You are, so we have a Christmas tree at home. We do the fake Christmas tree. Don't judge us, all right? We do the fake tree. I tried to sneak a little thing scent in there one time, and it made the dogs puke, and so we got rid of that. <laughs> but the Christmas tree, uh, <laughs> our, our poor fake Christmas tree, it started off strong. There was some lights out, and I tried to, I spent three hours checking the lights, it stayed lit for a little bit, and now the whole top half of our tree is completely dark. And there's so much to that lesson right there. First of all, the tree came, it was a fake tree, and it came with factory-installed lights. You came factory-installed to worship. It's just what you are. It's who you are. You are factory-installed to worship Bow down, seek something or someone to complete you and your king me in your life. And what can happen is you realize the lights just keep going out. It doesn't really satisfy. So you might string another set of lights around it, or you keep trying to figure out something else to make the lights come on. But at the end of the day, there's a darkness that continues to lurk because you're looking in the wrong place. Listen, if there's any doubt that you and I aren't, factory installed to worship, just go home and watch about 10 minutes of commercials. They're speaking to your worship nerve, to your worship heart. Or think about the Friday after Thanksgiving. There is all kinds of beckoning to come worship, to find things that will satisfy, to find things that we can feel that would satisfy our lives, light up our lives, or even come bow down in a sense to our lives that would fulfill us and it comes up short every single time. And then you have Jesus born, King of the Jews, King of Kings. And in John chapter 10, verse 10, he says that I have come to bring you life and life to the full. This is what God intends for you. Yes, you're intended to place your faith in Jesus and to be made right with God for all, for all, forever. Yet at the same time, you're going to spend a little longer here too before that gets there for you. And so Jesus says, while you're here, look to me as your king, and I will bring you life, peace, joy, meaning, and life to the full, a fullness into your heart and into your soul that you can never bring to your life. And even if you kind of stay in the admiration place of Christmas, not in the devotion place, even if you just kind of let it disturb and, and move on, I wonder if you would think through then, give you a little thing to disturb you as you leave, you're welcome, that how's the king me going to serve you when everything in your life begins to fall apart? A rogue cell in your body, loved ones who pass, 
What, what then? Who's going to really matter then? Speaking of which, later on in Matthew chapter 2, there are these words that are haunting, disturbing. And it's three words, Matthew chapter 2, verse 19, after Herod died. After Herod died. Herod couldn't take his throne with him. Herod couldn't take his stuff with him. He died. You know, even Grinch had a change of heart. Herod didn't. Now the question is, will you? And what's even more striking, where it says after Herod died, Herod died six miles away from the true king. Six miles away. About a one and a half hour walk away. 10,000 steps Fitbit. All the way there. That's all he had. Are you... (laughs) You can admire Jesus and Christmas and still be six miles away from him being your king. Disturbed by Christmas. There can only be one king. And you're not it. I'm not it. There's only one king. The king of kings. Now, what will it be for you in this game of thrones? What will it be? Choose you this day, this Christmas, whom you you will serve. Who will take the throne of your heart? Who will truly be king? Will you pray with me? Well, Lord, here we are, and just receiving through your spirit the word. I pray there, there is, even on a Christmas Eve, there is, even in this moment, a disturbance in the heart about who we are really bowing to and who truly is king. Well, Lord, in this moment, I look to you and we look to you to confess and to help our unbelief that you are the king, that you're not just the king, you're the king of kings. You're the king who gave up his glory and went to the cross, pierced there with nails, blood poured out, the cry of, my God, why have you forsaken me? The crown fell as you died. On the third day, though, resurrected, showing you truly are the king, and you are worthy, and you are worth our very lives. So, Lord, may it be today, in this moment, that there is a disturbance, but a disturbance toward hope and joy and meaning toward you, the King of kings. And it's in your name, King Jesus, I pray. Amen.